Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to a special Tuesday afternoon edition of Nightlight. A lot of Nightlight shows delve into recreating ancient times with researchers who have very plausible uh, theories, but you know, they're dealing with just a few ad- artifacts and no video. Uh, you know, we've gone way back to the Denisovan peoples you know, 100,000 years ago, Atlantis. Uh, but it, today's show is more focused on a time when you know, a lot of us were just in elementary school, but we have a person who helped to uh, create punk rock and was a witness to the punk scene on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, Gary Lockman has been a guest with Barbara discussing his books on esoteric philosophies, but in another time, he was a founding member of Blondie and inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2006. He went by the name of Gary Valentine then and has a fantastic autobiography of his time with Blondie and the punk, and the punk scene. And you know, he, he worked with Iggy Pop and uh, so many other you know, big name people. Uh, his autobiography is entitled New York Rocker, and it's available on Amazon. Hi, Gary. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Mark. How are you doing? Thank oh. you again for wanting to go over these uh, these old times. <laughs> yeah, that. Uh, yeah, it's. It, when, you know, I first produced the show. Uh, you know, when you. You know, we're Barbara's guest the first time in, what was it, like May or something. And I wanted to have you on, you know, just talk about, you know, re- recreating CBGB. Hmm. And, you know, you said, oh, you, I have a, a biography or autobiography on it. And, you know, the, so I went out and got the book and, you know, f- finally uh, have a chance to w- recreate your youth. <laughs> this is going to be a lot of fun. Well, this, uh, see, that's a bad sign for people my age, and they start doing that. This is a sign that they're heading towards senility and things like that. So, <laughs> um, I want everyone to know this is an exception this evening. Right. Well, th- th- thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I just yeah, yeah. You know, w- w- want to start off with you know, a little story about you know, like why this show uh, – is uh, has like a personal connection uh, for for me. Uh, I know, probably September of 2012. Uh, and saw on you know uh, the Palace Theater uh, website that uh, oh you know Blondie was going to be playing playing there in October. So yeah, you know, I asked my wife, hey you, you hey. Uh, you, Let's go see Blondie for you know your birthday. So you know, I got the tickets. You know, uh, 
thought, okay, let me type up this little letter of introduction and in and case, you know, we actually get to meet uh, Debbie and you know, see if she'd want to uh, be a guest on a you know, sh- show I was doing then. Uh, you know, got up there in the middle of the afternoon and, and you know, thought we you know, see if uh, the tour bus pulls up or something like that. So, but, you know, by the time we got there, you know, the, t- you know, the tour bus was already parked. And, you know, my wife and I were just hanging out uh, with, you know, like eight, ten other people. And uh, I was there for about 30 minutes and all of a sudden Clem comes around the front of the bus and you know, he says, says hi to everyone uh, you know signed a uh, well worn album and, and you know, it takes off for a jog around town uh, about 15 minutes later uh, suddenly emerges and everyone you know, gathers around her and she, she autographs all these albums and well, when it got to my turn uh, I gave her the uh, paper that I had uh, typed up uh, invite her to an interview and, uh, and she said you know what, what do you want to talk about so you know the uh, your new CD, uh, you know, your legacy, what's next for Blondie, and your appearance on the Muppet Show, and she 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 burst out laughing about that, and and you know, she said everyone, you know, okay, let's uh, get do all the photos, and you know, she took, uh, you know, spent, you know, was kind enough to spend a lot of time, you know, making sure everyone. Got the photos, and uh, she had to, you know, head, head into the dressing room. And uh, you know, when she was walking away, I was like, "Oh, we love you, Debbie!" And you know, I I yelled, uh, "Long live the new flesh!" And she turned around and gave, gave me this smile, and she went into the uh, you know, venue and. You know, a couple hours later, she started a fantastic show. So that's my little story of having met two of your bandmates, and now you're a guest on our show again for the third time. And uh, yeah, it's kind of feel like a Blondie insider. <laughs> but right, but uh, you know, since um yeah you know, since I care about history and and want to have some kicks and want to get some chicks let's uh get into the nightlight time machine designed by Ed Wood and go back to like that 70 late 73 early 74 time period <laughs> okay so you know Woodstock is what about five years ago, uh, you know about what four three, I would have, like sixty nine so yeah, seventy three okay. so okay we have what about another three or four years before the Sex Pistols and disco and new wave yeah. you're in <sighs> just starting college. So you're in this transitional state, you know, the music in a transitional uh-huh. state too. Uh, you know, let's recreate the scene that you find yourself in at at that time. At uh, that time, uh, well, I was living in New Jersey, uh, Bayonne, New Jersey, which is the other side um, of the Hudson from downtown New York, Manhattan. Um, uh, put it this way: When I was growing up, I, I could I could see them building um, the well. It's around this time I could see them building the World Trade Center. So already, it's not even going up by this. That's around the same time. And um, well, I mean, musically, 
I was I was getting introduced at the time to people like Bowie and uh, uh, Iggy and Lou Reed and also uh, from England, Martha Hoople was a band that I, I really got into. He and Hunter, I, I, I liked a great deal. I actually mm-hmm. got to meet him. Got to meet mm-hmm. him. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk on. about that. And um, uh, well, I got to meet all these guys. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what I say. I, I, I had nothing to complain about. Um, but everyone else was very angry um, in the blank generation and all that. They were all very, very angry people. But um, uh, yeah, but I, I and 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 the New York Dolls and the New York Dolls were, were in many ways the most uh, influential. I mean, personally, in the sense that, um, A, I could go just over the um, you know, river on the PATH train, which is at the New Jersey kind of underground um, transit that took you um, under the Hudson over to New York, and then uh, could go see them play, and, uh, which I did. Um, and also that what they played was very simple. It was, uh, you know, three chords, you know, it was, and it, it was, I mean, when you, when you look back at that time, and it was, I always think it's a very strange thing, because um, rock was already going through a nostalgic period itself, because in the early 70s, you had this kind of back to the roots sort of sensibility, and mm-hmm. there were band, bands like Sha Na Na were doing all the doo-wop covers, and people like Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard were coming out and having kind of, um, you know, um, second careers again in this period. And, you know, even even big, big stars like John Lennon was kind of doing songs that were like, you know, going back to the roots and all this kind of thing. So um, what was happening in New York, I would say, I mean, from, from what I, you know, what I was coming to understand, because there were people um, that I knew in my hometown that were kind of on this edge. They were the fringe people, you know, because everybody else was sort of into, you know, mainstream rock or Grateful Dead and all this kind of thing. And it was kind of late, late six, it was early seventies and getting on to the mid seventies, but it was sort of that late sixties sensibility and, you know, uh, that kind of thing, Pink Floyd and all that. And uh, this was before anything was happening in, in, in England. And um, so I, I started getting into this whole what what was known as glam rock here in the UK, but it was called glitter in the states. And you know, it 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 had its kind of hypertrophied, uh, uh, exaggerated um, expression in in, in kiss. You know? But I mean, the kind of I mean, you know, uh, but um, they kind of took it, and made it Hollywood. But the the, the dolls um, they were playing this really simple three chord rock that was sounded like early Rolling Stones. And the thing is, is that when I was went to see them play, they were playing in um, what 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 was a drag club most of the time in New York in in the East Village, a place called Club Eighty Two, on Fourth uh, Street, Second Avenue. And um, there were, used to be a place called the Mercer Arts Center, which I, that was just before my time. This place literally collapsed; it, it, it fell to pieces, and so they couldn't play there anymore. And they were all these bands that were sort of this underground New York scene at the time looking for a place to play and somehow they managed to talk to people who ran this this um, drag club club 82 um, <clears throat> into letting them play and so people started going there and when myself and these other people I knew in New Jersey these the the, the, the weirdos you know the fringe characters heard about this we went over and we started wearing makeup and all that kind of thing and hanging out at club 82 and we saw, saw, saw the dolls I mean the first time I <clears throat> saw Debbie um, Harry was when, in her band, the Stilettos, and they were opening for somebody. May have been Wayne County. I can't remember now exactly. Um, and at Club 82, but also Bowie and Lou Reed were hanging out there. That was what we read about in the ma- in the magazines. I think it was Rock Scene magazine or something like that. So we decided to go and hang out there, and so we did. And that, you know, we, we we were walking on the wild side and everything else, and it was this wild time. And it was a very wild time for myself personally because I was. You know, I, I got I got thrown out of my home. I I, I wound up living um, uh, in a variety of different sort of crash pads on, under less than salubrious conditions. But going through the kind of uh, you know kind of season of hell that um, apparently you're supposed to go through if you want to be a poet and all that kind of thing, which is what I I wanted to do at the time first. Um, and then you know out of that scene. Um, the next thing started happening, you know, because the the glitter kind of died down after a certain point. It didn't. I mean, I guess the big the big 
people made the big um, kind of success with it was Bowie, you know, with uh, Ziggy Stardust and, and, and a variety of things. And then he changed direction um, at a certain point. And um, I was living in New York at the time. I was uh, living in the East Village on 10th Street between um, First Avenue and Avenue A. And I was uh, starving, as one has to be, if you want to go through your poetic season of hell. And I was working as a messenger and reading a lot of um, Henry Miller and lots of other stuff and mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, standing in front of the Strand Bookshop and deciding which, which you know, avant-garde paperback I could get for my quarter and things like that. And um, Clem Burke, who I knew from Bayonne, who was uh, we went to high school together and he was playing, he played in all these bands and band, all these cover bands, you know, that did a variety of things. And, you know, they, it, first, you know, first off, it's like he's covering Santana and the Allman brothers and, you know, people like that. And then when glitter came, he got into another band and they started doing sort of Bowie S kinds of things. And they were doing original songs too. Uh, and that was interesting. And um, he answered an ad in the village voice um, for a man in New York that was looking for a drummer. And this was Debbie, uh, Harry and Chris died because their drummer had left for I forget exactly why and so Clem started playing there and uh, I started going to their gigs and uh, long story short um, they lost their bass player uh, because uh, well this is this is the this is the, the story this is the the, histo- the narrative is there's another band, one of the big bands that were pioneering, the pioneer bands. I mean, Patti Smith was sort of one of the pioneer, the, the pioneer sort of of this, you know, revived New York scene. And then the television, Tom Berlain's band, um, they were the other band. And um, the bass player in television is Richard Hell. And he's pretty much the guy who invented punk rock, or he pretty much wore the first torn T-shirt, uh, put it that way. Uh, this is before safety pins. Um, so, uh, but he had the first torn T-shirt, and um, he he left television because he wanted to start his own band. And so Tom Berlane nabbed Fred Smith, who was playing bass in Blondie, and Patty Smith was she was sort of in and on Grease in the background, all this kind of rivalry between Chris and, uh, between Debbie and Patty. That's kind of backstory and those kind of thing. But she basically told Fred Smith to leave Blondie to join television because Blondie isn't going anywhere. And uh, <laughs> kind of ironic in the long run. And um, so Fred left to join Blondie. And Clem knew that I could kind of sort of almost maybe play. Uh, uh, it was like I had, had played in like real garage bands, as they call them here. You know, the bands where you played in the weekend and you drove your parents crazy. You had your friends over and they were playing, you know, covering you know, simple rock tunes in the garage, you know, uh, and, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I wasn't really a musician. I mean, this is the thing. It was, this is one of the ironies in my own life is I, I'm, I'm the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I've got gold records, hit, hit records. I play with lots of people and I'm doing this show, but I was the last person one would have expected at this time, um, to have been doing this because I really couldn't play anything. You know, I, I was the kind of nerdy guy who knew the lyrics, the kind of poet guy, you know, and, um, so in any case, I was, you know, I, I had gone to all these gigs. Um, I was living in this place on, on the low, as I said, in the East Village. And in, in, it, it was literally a storefront that, you know, someone has shoved a, a sofa bed into and you know, a couple other things and turned it. And now it's a flat. And um, one of the things that was shoved in there was this old piano. And, you know, every other key was broken. But I had learned, I'd somehow learned, I'd learned how to bang out chords. I learned how to bang out a few chords on the guitar. I learned how to bang out a few chords on the piano. And I just started writing songs. And so this, this very bad poetry I was writing got transformed into, you know, increasingly slightly better songs. And um, Clem said, why don't you come in audition? Um, and I was, I mean, there's a whole other story. The guy was, the guy was living in, in I, I can't even go into that story, but the guy I was living with in this place, um, he was sort of the William Burroughs of where I grew up in New Jersey. And he later became a, a born again Christian and went through this strange kind of transformation. So I was going through all that, you know, at, the, at this time. And um, but Clem said, why don't, you know, come and audition. I don't have a bass guitar. I said, don't worry, we'll, we'll borrow one or something. So I went and I was able to thump out, you know, we, we jammed on a Stone song, Live With Me, which I think is on Beggar's Banquet. You know, we jammed on that for about an hour or something. And then it's like, okay, it worked. And so I wound up playing with them. Um, and then um, I um, 
soon after that, I, you know, after, you know, doing a few gigs with them and coming, because I was, I had to leave the place I was living in New York because this guy, as I said, he was born again Christian and he, 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 he had started, he joined this, this cult and he was, he was, he was going off to Israel to live in the kibbutz. And uh, it's because the end of the world was coming and all this weird stuff. And I, and I, I he invited me to join him, but I, I declined. Um, and I, um, you know, I didn't know nowhere to live. So I had to go back home. And then for the first few months when I was playing in Blondie, I, I was still living, uh, living back at home with my parents and I was, it, it, that didn't work out. And so the ultimatum was, you know, either, either, <clears throat> you know, stop coming in at four in the morning or, you know, um, you know, you, you know, go on, leave. So I, I left. And this is when I wound up for a while. I was homeless. Uh, I was sleeping in rehearsal spaces and uh, sort of, what do they call, uh, 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 couch, uh, um, I forget what it's called. Um, but, um, uh, um, uh, any case, uh, I wound up having, to, uh, wound up living with Chris, Chris and Debbie. Um, and Debbie had this small one bedroom in little Italy. And um, Chris had his own flat over in, in the uh, sort of Lower East Side, but he was subletting that to one of the Ramones. Okay, and, and Gary, since you know uh, you, you just got us to, yeah, you, know, you you're part of the That's band. About spring, spring 1975. Yeah. It, okay, and, and you, know, you, you you're you didn't have any place to. Go so, you know, Chris and Debbie had you couch surfing. That's what I was yeah. doing. Couch surfing. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And yeah, you have know, an uh, interesting passage in your book. Uh, but but we often talked about what was magic. Like Chris Benton was into the occult and he was oh, yeah, yeah. more serious about it. Chris was certainly a sucker for anything to do with vampires, voodoo, ghosts, <laughs> and witches. He used to go on about spirits and poltergeists inhabiting the loft. Debbie agreed and would chip in about UFOs telling me in all seriousness that she was an alien. She and Chris would sometimes consult the I Ching together, but it always seemed to me that they would do the opposite of what it advised. <laughs> I, you know, this is uh, so, some really interesting behind the scenes mm -hmm. yeah. uh, look at what's going on inside this tiny apartment. Mm. Oh, well that, well, that was a different place. I mean, we, we, uh, uh, I was I was living with them on Thompson Street, um, and you know something like at at a Goodfellas or, or you know uh, or that neighborhood, like or the Godfather, <laughs> so it's that kind of thing. And then uh, that was a really small place. And it, after I forget a couple months or something, um, we moved into this uh, loft space on the Bowery, which was it was just a block or so away from CBGB. And the CBGB, uh, for people who don't know, is this uh, legendary, uh, really, really hole-in-the-wall dive bar on the Bowery in Bleecker Street uh, that just happened to be the place where, after the kind of change in music, well, the, actually, it's the place where the change in music started happening, um, where bands like Patti Smith and Television um, they weren't doing it at Club 82 anymore. The glitter scene had, had, had dropped away. This is late 74 or something like that. And they started playing at this place. And CBGB means country, blue, grass, and blues. And that was originally the Hilly Crystal, the owner's idea for the place. And it was a big biker bar. And the Hells Angels lived, you know, not too far away. There was a whole Angels, Hells Angels block, which I think was East 3rd Street. Um, but, but, and so, you know, long story short, the New York scene, that was the place where it was started in CBGB. And, and we lived on the Bowery, 266 Bowery, if you're ever in New York. <laughs> I was there not too long ago. And the whole area of the Bowery has completely changed. It's unrecognizable. I mean, um, it, you know, it, it, and CBGB isn't there. It's some clothes shop where it, nobody who ever played at CBGBs could afford any, any article of clothing that's sold um, in that place. So it's a complete, you know, it should be on, you know, Rodeo Drive and Beverly Hills or something like that. But in any case, except for the place where we live, because <laughs> where we live, it looks, the outside of it looks exactly the same. I'm sure the inside is probably renovated. So 
I was really surprised by that, and, and actually, uh, I like that idea because it seemed like at least this remained. I mean, um, but at, at any case, so we lived a block or so, and you know, um, everybody lived in that neighborhood. Everyone was around. Everyone was relatively within a stone's throw of each other, as it were. When William Burroughs lived just up the road from us on the Bowery, uh, the Ramones had a loft. It's called, I think, Joey Ramone Place now, where their loft was. Um, just again, the the other side of CBGB, you know, a block or so away. And, um, you know, other people lived in other places not too far away. The Talking Heads had a place down on Delancey Street. And, but we moved into this loft space. And um, it, was, it was big, you know, it was really big, you know, by, by New York standards. And so Chris, Debbie, and I uh, started living there. And the guy who lived there, this guy Benton, Benton Quinn, um, uh, a very interesting guy. He was an artist of sorts, uh, strange, histrionic, you know, kind of theatrical character, wild kind of gay guy that, into the into the Hell's Angels, into lots of strange stuff and magic and Aleister Crowley. And that's how I got interested in Aleister Crowley. And that's how I got interested in the kind of stuff I spent the rest of my life investigating. And now I've been writing about for quite some time. And he was really into Crowley and he used to do these, he had a Crowley off deck of tarot and that was rare at the time and he used to do impromptu readings and he painted these big kind of canvases and based on the tarot deck and all this kind of thing and you know and and in the this loft space we collected all this weird stuff you know we, we there was like a statue of a nun and um uh, someone had found these tibetan tankas you know these tantric paintings um or scrolls and they were up on on the walls and one of them depicted a, a monk who had died. He was all chopped up in, in this tub. And, you know, the others were boiling him away and they were going to eat him and all this kind of thing. And it was just, you know, weird stuff. And there was pentagram, you know, upside down crosses and viewed. And so it was kind of all kitschy, but at the same time, you know, kind of it was strange things happened. I mean, I have to say, you know, uh, Chris, Chris Stein saved my life there once because uh, I was electrocuted. I mean, I, I was, uh, uh, I, I picked up a lamp in my little section of, of the rehearsal space. That was my, my bit. And it must've had a short and I just got, you know, however many volts running through me and I was paralyzed. I couldn't let go of it. I couldn't say anything. I was just kind of squeaking and um, no one was around me. And then he came, it was a, you know, it was a big loft space. So he came, from the farthest, you know, back bit where he was in, that was there, he, uh, he and Debbie's room. He just came in to where I was and, you know, totally the other side of the, of, of the floor. Um, and he saw what was happening and just casually went over and unplugged the lamp. Um, but, uh, you know, if no one else had been there, who knows? Uh, so uh, it was that kind of place. And so there were kind of strange things happening. Um, there was all, Debbie and Chris talked about, you know, that that some uh, uh, gangster had lived there in the past, and that there was it, it had been some kind of doll factory or some. I, I don't know. There was all these strange. I can't remember all of them. It's all in the book, New York Rocker, My Life in the Blank Generation. Uh, but it was, it, it, but it was one of the places where the scene was happening too, because we had this fantastic party in early '76, when after Clem had been in England for a while, and he brought back albums. And one of the big bands that. You know, it doesn't get mentioned uh, that was influential on the New York scene was Dr. Feelgood. It was a British band. Again, this is the pre-punk thing. And Dr. Feelgood was this sort of pub band. Wilco Johnson was this uh, great, you know, kind of just, you know, great guitarist and all that. And uh, um, <clears throat> again, it wasn't, um, wasn't yet called punk or anything, but Dr. Feelgood, they, they, again, they were kind of stripped down, straightforward kind of rhythm and blues, you know, um, pub rock band. And so, yeah, we had this great party when Clem came back and he played all the stuff he brought back from England. And that was kind of like a, a, a pivot point when after that we, we emerged as this, as this new blondie. Because we had acquired Jimmy Destry. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, that, that, you know, Destry, that wasn't his, you know, his, his given name. And uh, he, he adopted that name too because of the film Destry Rides Again. Um, so that's when we kind of back because Blondie in the early days, we, would, uh, we, we were the worst band. Nobody ever expected us to ever become successful in any way whatsoever. Um, you know, literally, I mean, I was, you know, everyone was kind of learning how to play except for Clem. He was, he was, he already knew how to play, but everybody else was learning how to play on stage. And that, that was kind of the, the, the ethos of that scene. Uh, it was the total opposite of what was happening in mainstream rock because it either, you know, it was so, you know, it was, it was, it was Las Vegas. It was so, you know, slicked down or 
it was like yes, Remus Lake and Palmer on this sort of you know Wagnerian operatic um, you know scale, and you had to go to the Juilliard School of Music in order to play rock and roll. So it was again, it was complete opposite of that, and a weird mixture of the art scene and the poetry scene with you know Patti Smith and Verlaine and Hell. They wrote poetry, and the lyrics mattered, you know, and there was short songs, and nobody aside. I mean, aside from Verlaine, who was television, they actually were a guitar band in the sense of he and, and Richard Lloyd, who were fantastic guitarists, and they're very different in styles, but they did play this, you know, remarkable kind of, almost like Grateful Dead sort of thing, it just, you know, long solos. But all the other bands weren't like that. It was short, sharp, you know, bang. And I mean, the, the Ramones were notorious. They had songs that were, some of the songs were, I think, were less than a minute. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 you know, Gary, you know, you just mentioned you know, uh, what the CBGB, uh, you know, building is now. But, you know, in 75 or so, uh, what was it, uh, July 4th, 75 mm. is when you mm. played your first yeah. uh, gig there. Uh, uh, what? You know, just give us a walk walk through if we were going to see you. You know, what was the stage like? You know, you also d- d- discuss like the, you know, most most of the activity. It smelled so horrible in there that <laughs> a- after the band was done, that you, you, you know you wanted to see everyone went outside and there's all, all this activity. Uh, you know, in, in the bathrooms that equaled whatever was going on uh, on the stage. Oh, no, it was, you know, I mean, it was a dive, you know, I mean, uh, as I said, it was a biker bar, um, but, um, you know, it, it was, uh, I mean, they had this dog, <laughs> Hilly, who was, again, he was this old biker guy, you know, uh, burly, bearded, um, you know, big, big guy, uh, and uh, he had a dog, and basically the dog, you know, shat everywhere, and, it, it, you know, <laughs> you know, and it was, the whole thing was like, I said it was it was before the punk thing. It was all this kind of you know we like dirt or you know we we like it rough. It wasn't love and peace. It was all kind of it wasn't health and well being. It was all kind of you know on on the edge kind of thing. And um, it was a dive. You walked in and there was uh, either Roberta Bailey or Felony Merv or somebody else was at the door and they checked you out. And if you were in the band, you got in free. Or if you were somebody, you got in. If not, you know. And initially, it was initially it was like being on a deserted island where everybody took in each other's washing, you know, because we, you know, it, it was, the audience was other band members, you know. So you had other bands come see you play initially, except for the the big names in the first the, the, the beginning, like Patti Smith or, or Television, and then gradually it became more. Um, and um, yeah, you, you walked in the place. They checked you out, and then it was a kind of it was just straight on uh, on onto your left. You walked in. There was, uh, if I remember correctly, the um, jukebox and you know tables, and you know, and then on your right was a long bar, and um, you know nothing fancy at all. I mean, the dressing room was nothing. It just was um, uh, some partition. Um, the, the toilet was nobody even used the toilet because it was horrible. They went outside. I guess the, I, I guess the women, the punkettes, used the toilet, but I don't know. I mean, lots of guys went outside. And it was like an empty lot nearby, and it was around it outside CBGBs. It was it, it was the Bowery, what, what the Bowery used to be, which was you know Skid Row, so homeless, you know, the homeless people, mostly men. All these different hotels. It was the Palace Hotel next door to you know, CB, uh, CBGB, which was a, 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 a flop house, you know, and that was all around, uh, around there. So it wasn't a particularly, you know, um, it was a salubrious kind of neighborhood. And then um, other places nearby, you know, catered to different kinds of, you know, weirdness. There were, you know, gay bars nearby and things of that sort. Uh, there was a truck and warehouse theater where my girlfriend at the time, Lisa Jane Persky, who um, later went on to do quite a few films and at, also was photographer and writing a lot for a newspaper called New York Rocker. That's where I stole the title uh, of my book from. Uh, she was doing a play with, um, you know, one, one of the, you know, classic people from this period, Divine, um, in, uh, in this truck and warehouse theater. It was called Woman Behind Bars, uh, where she was, she was raped twice nightly by, by Divine. And as I say in the book, you know, 
uh, everybody started going to see this play and everyone on the scene saw my girlfriend, you know, naked twice, you know, already um, in, you know, in uh, by going to see this play. So it, it was an area with all this kind of, you know, strange transgressive stuff was going on, but it wasn't, you know, it was all kind of down and, and gritty and, um, you know, uh, not not fancy, which was, that was the thing. It wasn't supposed to be that. That was, you know, it was away from the mainstream kind of thing. And, you know, it had a horrible smell. The beer was cheap and the sound system wasn't the greatest, but you, you know, and it didn't, I don't know, it couldn't hold that many people. It wasn't a big place. But and, and that, in that early period, you got, you know, if you were there as I was, and, you know, that's, uh, I'm very happy that I was there. I had fantastic fond memories from the time. You just got to see up close all these people, you know, basically become who they were. So, you know, like the Ramones and Talking Heads um, and, and Blondie. And uh, there were bands that didn't get known beyond it. There was a great band called the Miamis. Uh, they wrote wonderful songs, very intelligent, satirical comic songs about current events and other bands, the Mumps, uh, Lance Loud, you know, who was part of the Warhol kind of circle and all that. Um, you know, they, 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 they didn't <clears throat> get the record deals and all that kind of thing. Uh, but at the scene at the time they were there. And um, yes. Okay. And, you know, since you just mentioned divine, uh, you know, you have, a little story in your book about um, when you first approached him about, is it true? <laughs> oh, from Pink Flamingos. Yes. Yeah, well, he said, he said, I mean, I mean, he, Divine is a he, um, you know, is a transvestite, but, you know, uh, who was made famous or infamous uh, in a series of films by John Waters, uh, one of which, the most famous one, notorious one, is called Pink Flamingos. And at the end of the film, there's a scene where Dwight eats uh, dog shit. Uh, if I can say that, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, and everyone always asks. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, for a time, uh, we went, we had lunch together a few times with, with Lisa and, and other things and went to some other events. And um, as you, uh, before we were recording, you mentioned uh, earlier that, um, I, in the book, I talk about um, doing this uh, video of Medea, uh-huh. uh, you know, the Greek tragedy of Medea with Divine playing, <laughs> playing Medea. And Lisa, my girlfriend at the time, myself, we were the children who were going to be executed. And this fellow Benton, who was, you know, who owned, uh, had the lease on the love space, we, we were living with Chris and Debbie. Um, I forget the character's name, but he plays the kind of the, the tutor. <laughs> and, and it's all method acting. And I remember one point I, I say in the book where he's dragging us across the floor. We're on our knees. And I say, hey, Benton, it hurts. And he says, it's supposed to hurt. You're about to be executed. <laughs> so I don't know whatever happened to that. But it, 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 in, in these days, it's the sort of thing that, you know, were it available, it would be up on YouTube and getting uh, going viral, I would think. So a lot of that, a lot of stuff from that time is lost because nobody had a video camera or it wasn't anything like now. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, you know, that was the thing and, and it all, it all crossed over. I mean, we did different things in the early days of Blondie. We did the, um, music to a production of, uh, play by a Warhol, um, sort of, uh, you know, play the Warhol circle, Jackie Curtis called uh, vain victory. If you can call it a play, it's just an endless kind of, you know, camp gay jokes, you know? Uh, and, but it, you know, uh, it was, uh, an introduction. It was, it was put on by people that were part of that world. Uh, and that world was still, you know, in, influential at the time and people that were involved with that were involved with Bowie and, and, um, you know, a variety of other things. And so there were all this, all, all that, all that kind of thing. And then the art scene too. So, I mean, it was a time when a lot of these things were just crossing over. So you would go to somebody's loft to some art event and then, you know, people that were, you, you knew from CBGB were, were there as well, or these art people would be going to the club, or you go to some poetry event or some film, you know, kind of thing. And um, and then you know, and then after a while, Max's Kansas City started co- happening. Because Max is Max is big in the late '60s and the early '70s, and that's when Warhol uh, held court there, 
and you know lots of people played there Iggy played there and you know Alice Cooper I think and, and you know lots of the people and it was a famous place to hang out and seen and be seen that was more that was more upmarket originally you know that was more rock stars hanging out which CBGB wasn't um, and and then it closed for a while and then it reopened and reinvented itself as, as another you know it was called New York Rock or Street Rock. It wasn't called Punk. Um, punk Magazine turned up, and then it kind of got this name. And it, 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 for me, it, it started to shift then because it became too easily recognizable. You could come over from, you know, man, you can come over from Connecticut and, you know, be a punk or something on the weekend. So, uh, and it started to lose that edge, kind of art, um, poetry, kind of leavening that the, the three chord rock uh, was getting. That to me made it made it made it, uh, very very interesting and pretty much unlike any other time I think. And, and Gary, when you know you're on stage at uh, CBGB, uh, you know in these early days of Blondie, you know, you, you're doing some covers, but you also have a disco song that's. Uh, going to uh, be uh, worldwide uh, Mm. hit uh, as uh, Heart of Glass. Uh, You know, you are writing some songs on your own. You've written, or or, you're going to write uh, some songs with uh, Debbie. uh, uh, what are some of the other songs that uh, y- you contri- contributed to the early days uh, of Blondie? Well, I mean, there was. So- I mean, I, I wrote a lot of songs once they got recorded. Ex Offender. I mean, I I, I wrote um, I wrote that, and then Debbie. Debbie well, I mean, yeah, I I I wrote the music and all that, and then the the lyrics to the chorus, and Debbie wrote the lyrics to the verse, and then. Um, a song we did called Kung Fu Girls. I, I wrote a bit of that, and Des- Jimmy Destry contributed something, and Debbie, you know, the, the lyrics. But even some songs that didn't get recorded, um, I, I wrote at the time because we were just experimenting, you know. And that was the thing. That that was the thing that I felt like, wow, you can do this. I I, I don't have to be a great guitarist like all these guys I knew when I was growing up. I used to put on the headphones and, and, and diligently work away at learning how to do the guitar solo that you know, like Clapton does there, or. Hendrix did there, or whatever Steve Howe, Steve Howe from Yes did there, which uh, that was you know completely beyond me. There's no way I could ever do that. But I could learn how to <laughs> put a few chords together, and you know suddenly I could you know as I said turn bad poetry into into you know halfway decent songs. And so I wrote I wrote quite a few songs around at the time. They they didn't get you know recorded. There's some live recordings um, up on YouTube. There's a weird song called Star Beast. <laughs> I mean, I, I wrote the music to, and then this this friend who was part of this gang of weirdos and fringe people that I mentioned earlier that I knew from New Jersey. Um, he wrote the lyrics, and he wrote his name was well, his, his name was Ronnie Toast. That was his sort of nom de plume. But uh, 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 he um, he wrote a couple. Uh, he co-wrote a couple uh, Blondie songs. Um, um, there's one called Cautious Lip I think that's on their second album Plastic Letters one called Rifle Range that's on their first album he wrote this weird stream of unconsciousness kind of poetry that somehow fit in uh, at the time and so um, um, uh, but I mean mean, the big song well Ex Offenders got got us the record deal and then later I wrote a song called I'm Always Touched by Your Presence Dear about Lisa and it was about all these telepathic experiences we were having these psychic experiences so at the time that I, I had got interested in all this kind of stuff because of living in this love space and being introduced to it by this fellow Benton and also discovering uh, this book called the, Outso- uh, the, the Occult by Colin Wilson, which changed my life, as, as one dramatically says. And I became very, very interested in all that sort of thing, the paranormal, the mystical, the magical, the esoteric and so on. And eventually, you know, my, my early youthful, enthusi- enthusiastic, um, indiscriminate embrace of it, you know, became, you know, um, you, know the, you know, more or less serious study of it. And, um, but at the time, I was just, you know, plunging into it. And uh, we started having these strange, when I was 
uh, we were on because uh, the Blondie's breakthrough. We, we recorded the album in late '76. It came out at the very end of '76, but in '77, we uh, sort of spring or, or late winter, or whatever '77, we went on this tour, um, U.S. tour, North American tour, opening for Iggy Iggy Pop. Uh, of Iggy and the Stooges, and he's one of the grandfathers or whatever, fathers of punk rock. And on that tour, David Bowie was in Iggy's band, although he was not announced. He was he was performing and traveling incognito. In fact, he drove, um, and if you know The Man Who Fell to Earth, that film, the car and the chauffeur in the film are, is Bowie's car. And he, he, he wouldn't fly, so he drove to all the different gigs. And, you know, we did, uh, it was a long tour and uh, there's a whole <laughs> account of the tour in, in, the, um, in the book. And, uh, but we got to know Iggy and then that later on, I, uh, after I left Blondie and, um, well, the, the last, the, the last person I played with, and, uh, at least at that time was I, uh, in 1981, I did two tours with, with Iggy Pop, uh, and Clem, Clem was, was drumming with him at that time too. So that, that was, that was like the, the other end. Of, of, of the story um but um yeah i mean I, you know we we recorded the album and um it came out in beginning beginning of or late, late it came out at the end like christmas time in fact I, I remember there was uh yes there was a review in the new york times on my birthday which is christmas eve so i thought that was quite um yeah that that augured well for the future gary is aside from uh, all the you know, stories of well-known musicians, uh, you, know, you do appropriately uh, credit those who helped to get you to where y- you are. Uh, you know, for example, uh, it, you wrote very fondly of Alan Betrock as well as mm. uh, Frankie Valli, uh, <laughs> Chuck Barris. Uh, ha- helped, I guess, but you know, you're also uh, fair with your re- recreations of you know the bad business deals, mm-hmm. um, the underbelly of the music scene, like Nancy and her influence in England, uh, while you know she she was. Shagging Sid. Oh, that's uh, a yeah. Um, yeah. You really, uh, this book really does uh, take a comprehensive view of uh, about a what a four four year uh, time period. Uh, 1974, 1981. So it's about seven years. Seven years. And then there's a tag. There's a tag end when I was briefly part of the Blondie, uh, the recidivist, the Blondie uh, reunion um, in the late '90s um, for a brief time. So I mean, the the main story is '74 to '81. Yeah, I I, I retired um, uh, after '81. Yeah, yeah. You also have. Couple pages or so uh, devoted to your uh, you know, the the, the day long uh, meeting with your hero Ian Hunter. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, that you know he he was a really big name at, at that time. Mm-hmm. And yeah. can can you tell us a little bit about you know the exhilaration of meeting a hero? Oh. Well, I mean, that was, uh, that was, uh, yeah, when I was living with Chris and Debbie, and it was um, New Year's Day, 76, and we were invited to Ian Hunter's house, it's somewhere in upstate New York, and uh, we were invited by Lee Black Childers, who was, um, again, part of the Warhol Circle, and a photographer, and part of the Bowie kind of um, entourage, and so on. And, uh, well, you know, well, one wonders <laughs> if Lee invited us because Debbie had, a, had, had her, had her car, her Camaro 
and we could drive there. But I, I, I'm not going to get catty about that sort of thing. That's the kind of thing you would argue about with Lee. He said, oh, Lee, you've only invited me because of my car. Oh, no, not at all. But um, any case, uh, we, we, yeah, we, and I mean, I, I, I said, I, Ian Hunter is not as well known probably these days. And at the time, he never quite got as big as he um, should have been. But he was in a band called Monta Hoople. And he wrote this really interesting song, you know, uh, interesting lyrics, and it was very good music. And um, they had a couple hits. Uh, well, the big hit, at least I think in the States, was All the Young Dudes. But that was um, Bowie had, had wrote that. Uh, but they had, you know, bigger hits in, in, in the UK. And he, he wrote A Diary of a Rock Star, which I, I liked too, because it was, um, you know, I don't know. And I, I sadly, I modeled myself after him and for some reason he wore dark glasses all the time so I started doing that I think it ruined my eyes uh, because I wore dark glasses at night often but I have to say when when um, we were invited to go on, on New Year's Day to spend New Year's Day at his place um, I wondered God you know does he wear the dark glasses at home and I, I discovered yes indeed he did and but we all you know we hung out we had you know uh, Christmas Day whatever food dinner drinks and all that and then we wound up jamming which was it was just a lot of fun. I mean, I'm I'm thinking like, what the hell? You know, not too long ago, I was I was in <laughs> New Jersey, wondering what I'm going to do with myself or whatever. How am I ever, ever going to escape this, uh, you know, one horse town, as it were? And here I am. You know, I'm hanging with one of my heroes. Um, and you know, for a while, that's that was happening in my life. I mean, I, I we, we we did this tour with Iggy. I later played with Iggy. Um, I you know, met Bowie more than, more than a few times. I, I even, I, I even got kicked out of Bowie's, uh, law space in, 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 in midtown Manhattan in, in the early eighties, yeah, around this time, 81 or something like that. And this is precisely because of an argument about Colin Wilson. Um, as I mentioned earlier, his book, the occult got me interested in all this sort of thing. And I, I, I went with a, f- a friend of mine, was invited to some get together at Bowie's loft space. And he, you know, he said, come on along. And I said, why not? You know, whatever. And, you know, not that I was any kind of, you know, close friend or anything like that, anything at all, but, you know, we did, um, our paths had crossed as it were, or my, 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 my path had crossed his larger orbit once or twice. And, um, but in any case, in a lone, the conversation, someone, and it had, the conversation had been about the occult or the supernatural. And, uh, my friend, said, you know, I guess to get things going or to get an entree. He said, oh, well, you know, Gary knows all about this because he reads Colin Wilson. And Bowie said, Colin Wilson, oh, he, he has a coven in, in Cornwall. And, you know, he draws pentagrams on people's doors and all this kind of stuff. And uh, that really wasn't the case. <laughs> and Bowie was a bit inspired at the time, if you nudge, nudge, wink, wink, know what I mean. And um, I... I Myself, being a very kind of straightforward and, you know, um, honest guy, I said, well, David, it's not really like that. Oh, no, he does. And he draws down those spirits of, you know, Nazis and all this weird stuff he was saying. And so long story short, um, that, that he had these two women bodyguards. And I forget which James Bond film it is where there's Thumper and Bambi, but they're like these two you know, women assassins, you know, who you know, try to, uh-huh. you know. Uh, do bond in. So it was sort of like Thumper and Bambi came over to me and they, they said, uh, David's a bit tired. Perhaps you should leave. I said, okay, <laughs> I'll go. So, you know, I got kicked out, but I, I later realized, you know, what he was doing. And long story short, I, I know which book of Wilson's he was reading at the time and he was conflating different things that Wilson was writing about, but he was under, under the influence of a um, inspirational substance. So I'll, I'll cut him some slack. It, uh, how did all this early on writing when you're 19, 20 oh. pr- prepare you for it, um, you know, writing these uh, h- historical books that mm. Barbara interviews you about? Well, I started reading about all this stuff then. That, that's basically it. And, and the more I read, the more interested I became. And I mean, one of the things I say in the book is gradually, one reason I left music is I was getting too smart for rock and roll. Um, 
and I, uh, my own band I had um, after Blondie. Uh, I left Blondie in seven, uh, late 77 and wound up moving to Los Angeles uh, because Lisa, well, Lisa and I were still together and she had gone there to pursue her acting career. And I got more into all of this sort of stuff there. Um, I started a band called The No, K-N-O-W, and that was because of my interest, interest in Gnosticism, which is about Gnosis, which is knowledge. And I got deeper interested in Crowley. I got involved with the Crowley group for a while. And, and um, uh, So, I mean, gradually, I just started reading, reading more of this sort of thing, and certainly more and more of Colin Wilson. Uh, I became, you know, rather addicted to his his books, and I when it, we were on tour. Whenever we were on tour, and uh, it, even even with Blondie, I would always get up early, and and if there were any like used bookshops in town, go to them and buy everything and all this kind of stuff. And then I would do the same, you know, with the No. I mean, even though we didn't get a big record deal, we were we were a very popular band on the East and West Coast. We were a bi-coastal band, and we used to do mini tours up either coast. You put out a couple singles and so on. And um, so gradually, I just, you know, and then when the No didn't get their own record deal, I, I kind of said, okay, I've, I've done this. Um, the taste to music was sort of changing, and I, I didn't feel inspired anymore to sort of write songs. For, uh, yeah, that's one of the re- reasons, too. And then... Uh, a friend of mine, Rob Dupre, who was a guitarist, he was in this band called The Mumps, one of the bands I mentioned that were around CB's day, but you know didn't get, um, you know, uh, didn't get the acclaim that later bands did. He was playing with Iggy, and Ivan Kral, who had originally who had played with Blondie for a while and played with Patti Smith for a while, he was playing with Iggy, but he jumped ship just before a tour. And Rob said, you know, do, do you want to come on tour? And I said, sure. I said, fine. You know. Uh, yeah, who doesn't want to play with Iggy? So and I knew most of the songs already, and you know the older ones, and then I learned the others on the tour bus. So, so for a year, I was I was just a hired gun. It was kind of like the Wild Bunch, you know, the Peckinpah film. It's like the Wild Bunch rock uh, uh, tour. It's, it was, uh, yeah, it was kind of make or break tour with Iggy with his um, uh, uh, record label at the time, Arista, I believe. And it was an album called Party. So that's what that was. That's what that tour was about. I was like, yeah. Party, so we did. And after that tour, I kind of said, "Okay, I've done it." And I, I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't really feel, you know, I didn't really want to play anymore. I kind of outgrew it at that point. And that I went completely different direction. I spent a couple of years not doing anything particular. I, I had uh, uh, President's Deer was a big hit in Europe and the UK, and um, it was top ten. So I got, you know, a nice chunk of royalties from that. And I just read a lot. I went on a kind of mini search of the miraculous in the early 80s, 80, 83, um, to places like Glastonbury and Shorts Cathedral uh, and Stonehenge. And then I also um, tracked down the prairie in Fontainebleau, where Gurdjieff had his Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man, because I was very interested in the Gurdjieff work at the time. And then that's when I also made my pilgrimage to Cornwall to meet Colin Wilson, where he lived. And... Um, uh, we, yeah, you know, I started the correspondence, and then later, you know, a friendship, you know, over, over the years. I mean, he died, uh, well, thirty years later in, in 2013, and so on. But during over those years, we stayed in touch and met many times, and you know, even stayed with me a couple uh, once in, in Los Angeles when I was living there in the early 90s. Um, so yeah, I mean, my life went in, in that direction, and I uh, went through many, many changes. <laughs> And here I am now, living in England for 25 years, having written quite a few books about all this stuff. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not really in the music. I mean, briefly, I said, I, I think I said earlier, I mean, Blondie, they, they started this kind of reunion uh, in, in the late 90s. And I got involved with that for a while. And I did uh, quite a few concerts with them and even did some recording with them, one of my songs, which uh, kind of got lost in the mix. I don't know, maybe it'll turn up one day. Um, and, um, yeah. And then after that, when I got kicked out of Blondie again, <laughs> twice uh, with 20 years in between, there's a story about that. Uh, but I had, had a band here for a while called Fire Escape. And we, we did, we did, you know, for about two years, we played lots of gigs in London and, and all that. And, um, then, you know, I had children, the writing had started. And so that's, that's what I needed to do. Okay. And- Gary, you uh, can I can can we take a break for a sec? <clears throat> sure. One sec, I'll be right back. 
Okay. And uh, this has been a fascinating recreation of hi- history. Um, it certainly um, presents a whole other side of this amazing man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sitting here giggling. It, you know, I've talked to him about John the Baptist and about all sorts of, you know, heavy-duty esoteric subjects and, you know, Crowley. And and to find out that he had this side of him um, it, in a way makes him more approachable <laughs> and in another way makes him less pro- approachable. <laughs> oh, it's... It's definitely uh, a New York rocker is definitely a um, captivating book. Well, yeah, and, and you know, you hear about this side of of music, but you know, he's flipping out, you know, things like Warhol and all of these. I mean, I actually recognize mm-hmm. some of these names. Some of the music you get into, I have no idea who you're talking about, but um, I am of a generation that recognizes just about every name he's thrown out there, which is kind of, I'm sitting here giggling, thinking, oh, my God, I recognize those names. And, of course, he was in New York, and I lived in New York, and, you know, so that, so that um you know, not that I can speak with any great amount of wisdom about all of this, but okay. I remember the songs and the places. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, okay, Gary. All right, I'm back. It, Thank you. Gary, Gary's back. It, it, yeah. I, um, if people are interested in seeing some of these early days of uh blondie you know they they can go to uh youtube see a whole bunch of stuff uh the uh don kirchner <laughs> ch- is is on youtube yeah and yeah. yeah there's like a little backstory there where uh you and chris uh traded instruments mm, and mm. He's not too. He wasn't too happy yeah. about that. Well, that was that was another reason. One of the reasons why I had to go. I mean, one reason I had to go. If you ever see that early video of X Offender, not only am I playing a guitar, but I'm jumping around madly, um, which is what you know. We were, you know, we weren't rock stars. We were kids playing rock. In any case, you know. It, it, but I mean, but the the other thing is, yeah, I, I played guitar because it was my song, X Offender, and I wanted to play guitar on it. And uh, um, you know, Chris is. His style, I mean, he was good, what he did and all that and, you know, all that, but the, I, I didn't think his style was good for the song and, and that kind of thing. And that was one of the bones of contention or the things that started friction was that I, I wanted to play guitar on, on on more of the songs that I was, I was writing. And uh, I mean, it, you know, it, it's understandable in hindsight that that you know, would have um, caused problems. But at the time I was young and, you know, um, Full of myself, and 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 now, now I'm just old and full of myself. So, it's kind of... but it, w- when it, you are living with Chris and Debbie, mm. or, or or just j- just in the band, mm. <clears throat> uh, you're 19. They're they're uh, basically. Ten years older. Uh, well, Debbie, you know, Debbie they're approaching thirty. Years, De- Debbie was ten years older. Uh, still is. She still is ten years mm-hmm. older. Than me. And um, Chris, I think, was about five, about five or six. So, I, mean, but I was, I was the youngest. I was, I was a kid. I mean, literally. Um, the, the other, the other guys were a year older than me, at least. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, she had been around for a while already. You know, she had a band in the late sixties called The Wind in the Willows, and um, then. Various different incarnations of groups uh, before it, it turned into Blondie. Um, I said the first time I saw it was the group she called the Stilettos, and then it was uh, three. It, it was like a girl group, like like the Supremes or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know? And it was all kind of camp, campy kind of stuff. Um, and then I don't know something Blondie and the Bonsai Babies and Angel and Snake and you know so different incarnations um, trying to make it, you know, on the scene. 
and um, uh, it's you know it started to gel into something when Clem started playing, and then I started playing, and then when we got Jimmy, then then it then it developed this kind of recognizable sound that was you know Blondie, uh, at least then it was kind of a '60s retro sound because Jimmy had this Farfisa organ, and I I mean I I grew up you know I heard all this great music on the radio, and I was a kid in the '60s. I mean I I was born at the end of '55, so. Uh, I remember going to school in the early 60s and even before the Beatles, it was, you know, all the girl groups kind of thing, you know, the Shirelles and all that. And then Ronettes and then there was the British invasion. And then you'd have, then the American groups start, you know, Love and Spoonful, the birds and all that. So I just grew up with all this kind of very melodic songs, you know, on the radio. And um, that's more or less what came out later on when I started writing songs. Um, but then, you know, the, t- the taste changed, and so it was sort of like, oh, well, you know, that, that's kind of what I did. So it wasn't really what, you know, what was happening after a certain point. And, and Gary, you <clears throat> have um, a lot of uh, you know, f- photos in your book, uh, pro- probably you know, never before published hmm. uh, photo. Uh, you, you just have a book book that uh, ha- has you know, these uh photos that uh depict the graffiti all over the walls and <laughs> the yeah you know, just uh recreate the scene plus you know you, you, you know your stories of being there it, it it's really a fantastic book that yeah you know, does fit in with what we we do on nightlight is you know, it's kind of focus on uh transporting people to different time periods and you know let's you know like I said at the beginning of the show you know, the, yeah. the, the researchers discuss it well we, you know you were actually there but mm. it, it's I I think New York rockers, if you like that time period, or you know, just a listener oh. is looking for something to read, it's a neat autobiography of all these big name uh, uh, people that uh, became your friends. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, uh, I wouldn't want to say everybody's in there. I, I, I tried to jam as many names as I could on the cover uh, <laughs> to get people's attention. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's all the, you know, I mean, uh, it was my life. It's what the, the, the subtitle is my life in the blank generation. And the blank generation was a song by Richard Hell. And that was um, kind of the, 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 the anthem as it were of, of that uh, period in New York then and blank sort of, you can fill in the blank. So it was about, it was about reinventing yourself. And uh, that's what, you know, people were doing then. And I was, you know, what can I say? I was uh, absolutely thrilled to have been part of it and, you know, um, and still be around. One of the sad things is that a lot of people from that time aren't around anymore. Um, I, I, I haven't looked up the statistics, but I, I wonder what, you know, um, how the mortality rate from that <clears throat> generation compares to, um, you know, uh, earlier and, 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 and later ones. Because um, many of the people I knew from that time just uh, you know, passed away um, for a right, variety of reasons, and um, and it's a New York that doesn't exist anymore. You talk about lost worlds, you know, uh, it just isn't there anymore. I mean, New York itself uh, has changed dramatically over the years. The, the parts of town where this took place aren't the same, and. Um, yeah, and the thing, you know, among among other things, is that uh, nobody can afford to live in New York anymore. You know, one of the th- 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 this music scene took place where it did because that part of New York at that time was still relatively affordable um, for people that were artists or musicians. You know, so but now you can't. Um, and, I mean, that is what always happens. The, the pioneers go and stake out the area, and then. Gradually, it, oh, okay, this is a part of town that's becoming popular and hip, and then the you know the um, landlords start hiking up the rent and push everybody out. So I don't even know where I, I, it was Brooklyn for a while, but I think Brooklyn's even 
out of reach of lots of people now too. So, um, but at that time, this was, and again, you have to remember this is New York 75. Uh, this is the, the garbage strike. Uh, 77 was son of Sam. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh, it was the blackout. It was strange, the blackout. Yep. It was a strange time. It was a strange time in New York. I mean, I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm nothing but happy that I was able to be there at that time and to live in these interesting neighborhoods. Like uh, I lived in the East village, the Bowery, I lived in the West Village, um, yeah, Little Italy, got to know New York, and um, you know during the, the formative years of my my late teens and early twenties. Um, yeah. So, what can I say? Well, thanks a lot for going through these uh, you know little trip down memory lane here. Yeah, the, and uh, I know Gary, you have um, you know a lot of important things that you need to uh, get to. And I, I just wanted uh, to let, you know, I you know, appreciate you making the suggestion of, uh, you know, get uh, my New York rocker and, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, c- coming back to, to re- recreate this, Interesting time period. I I'm very appreciative of you know th- th- this opportunity mm-hmm. and the suggestion you made. I, I you know this was really a terrific show. It was a lot of fun, mm-hmm. and I, I know you have to uh, uh, get get back to business. But <laughs> I I just wanted to thank. Oh, well, thank you. It was a pleasure. I mean, you know, if, if your listeners want to get a sense of it, uh, listen to the first albums everybody made. You know, so the first Patti Smith, first television, first Ramones, first Talking Heads, the first Blondie album. And, um, yeah, it'll give you a sense of what it was like. Okay. And, and, uh, uh, and of course, and of course, buy my book, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah it's, it's, it's <laughs> several of your books. And it, where where do you... Uh, you want to send people to get, uh, oh, it's on just, Amazon, you know, I mean, it's not, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, the, inner the book, traditions. Oh, well, well, I mean, my, 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 my other stuff, the, you know, the, the books I've been writing, I mean, no, that's just, you know, I mean, you can, you can get them on Amazon or anything. Uh, I'm, I have a website. Uh, I, I, I don't know much about this kind of thing, but as I said, as you mentioned, there's, there's some early clips, uh, Blondie on 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 YouTube. There's some very very early stuff, some very early black and white stuff. Um, you know, so like from the very earliest days, I was playing with them. So for you know from archival perspective, it's very interesting. And and there's a, there's other there's other stuff too. Uh, I mean, I think there's even bits of some clips of when I was playing with them again. In I, I, I did this uh, when I started playing with them again in '96, late '96, very. Uh, for about a year, one of the first things, well, the first thing we did was we, um, Chris Debbie and I, uh, played at this tribute to William Burroughs in Lawrence, Kansas. I mean, Burroughs was still alive at the time. Uh, and other people on the bill were like Patti Smith, Philip Glass, uh, God, uh, Laurie Anderson, um, kind of the New York hip crowd. So, I mean, after being out of it for a long time, and this was all during this period when I just moved back. I just moved to London. I'd already did this tour of Eastern. I was writing, I was covering an arts festival in Boston. Strange stuff was happening. And then I got um, a call to come, you know, asking me if he wanted to come back to New York and put the band back together. So I said, yeah, what, what the hell? And so I went. And then one of the first things we did was go and do this show. And there's some clips of that up on, on YouTube, too. So, you know. There's some stuff out there. There's some evidence of all this stuff out out with the general cultural debris out there. So you can, if you really want to find it, you can. Okay, and, and I've just been always really impressed with how accurate your memory was on the dates. The uh, people who were the headliners, or, or mm. you know, they were opening for you. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's really uh, you, you, you you do demonstrate a uh, thorough uh, recollection of 
to some of these shows and uh, festivals? Mm. Uh, I, you know, I, I kept journals at the time, and you know, oh. all, all that sort of thing. And um, yeah, you know, I was. I mean, I, I wanted to write the whole time I was doing all this, but um, it, it took me quite some time to be able to learn how to write something that people would find readable. I mean, I had at least a good ten years between leaving music and and starting to you know write um, through magazines and journals in the early nineties. Yeah, but it's a different thing, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, for me, it's a, it's a personal transformation, as it were, from going, you know, from being, a, well, you might want to say, more right brain artistic kind of character to, you know, uh, ten years later, kind of focusing on a more, I don't know, more well, left brain, but um, very different, you know, kind of approach approach to things. And um, the, the songwriting just came to me at the time. Whereas uh, I had to learn how to write, you know, readable prose. Okay. So, uh, yeah. What is next? Uh, next? Uh, uh, I don't know. Some sort of um, mid books at the moment. Um, I have a book it was supposed to come out next year, but because of COVID, it's been pushed back a year. Mm-hmm. And it's called Time and the Dreaming Mind, and it's about my experiences with precognitive dreams and uh, synchronicities, those odd, meaningful coincidences that happen to us um, more often than we probably know. Uh, and yeah, so that's, that's um, again, it's supposed to come out next year, but with any luck, it'll be out early to, to 2022. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Uh, uh, you, you are welcome to return uh to cover yeah i'll let you know yeah oh, when, when, please when, do. That's hap- when that's happening i'll i'll, I'll uh, be posting about it and all that so okay and, and there's a blondie box set in the works oh, that right. yeah is... yeah it's one of these big you know collections of everything so um i i they i they asked me for some you know um memories and so on and so on so there's um a, contributed something to liner notes and so on. And uh, yeah, it's a big, you know, I'm, I'm a you know a little part of that. A few, a few recordings of me in there, but you know, it's their whole, their whole career. So um, okay. that, that's coming out. I don't know exactly when, but relatively soon, I think, because they keep telling me it's on its way. Okay. So uh, people can look for. Yeah. Watch out for that. Yeah. The uh, Blondie box set. Okay. Uh, G- uh, Gary, uh, I know he- you want to do in you know, j- just about an hour, and we've gone a, a little bit over. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I, uh, I just don't want to hold you up anymore. Is, is there anything else you want to cover? Oh uh, no, no, it's fine. Um, I actually need to have dinner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I, I know. It's, uh, but it, no, it, this has been great. It's fun. It's been fun talking about all this stuff. I, I, I don't talk about it that often, so it's uh, yeah, it was fun. I, I, I am very appreciative and you know barbara's had a good time with the show too and you know let's uh, just wrap it up and i'm sure you're going to be back sometime Mm. soon and uh, i i just want to thank you and uh recommend uh for the listeners to get gary valentine's new york rocker it's a, a terrific autobiography thank you very much all right Take take care, Gary. You too. Take care, Mark. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye now.